Um, good morning, class. Um, nice to have you here today. Uh, here comes the last day of our uh, Pulitzer workshop. Um, this morning we have two speakers. Uh, we we have uh, Ewan uh, Maescu from Guardian, and he will talk about um, the National Security Agency and the um, uh, Snowden case. Yep. And we'll have our second speaker, uh, Curtis Lee. Uh, he will talk about shootings in the U.S. and about how to change the law. Um, it is our greatest honor here to have them around the campus and really having a, um, a very frank and in-depth dialogue with all the students, sharing the, their experience and their insights. So please join me to welcome our first speaker, um, Ewan Maestro. Thank you so much. Good morning to you. Um, I, I, has everyone here heard me speak about Snowden already? Or <laughs> um, okay then. So I, I, today, you know, the last uh, lecture I gave, the last two lectures have been about Snowden, the the person, and what happened in Hong Kong. Uh, today, I'd like to talk more broadly about what it was that Snowden revealed and why it matters. So I'll just click through this. Uh, if there's anybody in the room that hasn't heard this story, uh, Edward Snowden was a spy, um, American spy, came to Hong Kong, disclosed lots of top secret documents uh, to uh, the Guardian, uh, myself and Glenn Greenwald and uh, an American filmmaker, Laura Fighters. So it's Vera Hattel, there's Snowden, and there's me and Glenn Greenwald. And that was Vanity Fair's uh, take on it. But the, I'm going to talk about um, the issue more broadly today. And this is a story, I think part of the reason the, the story sort of resonated was because it revealed something about uh, the nature of government today, surveillance. Uh, but from a journalistic point of view, it also seemed uh, anything to do with spies has a resonance. And because it's set in Hong Kong, if you're in America or Britain, Hong Kong seems exotic. So you, you have a combination of all these things and seem to capture people's imagination. Uh, th this is uh, the actor Daniel Craig and James Bond. And this is, uh, at least in Britain, I think in America, when people think of spies, they think of James Bond. Now this isn't James Bond. This is a real British spy. His name is Alistair Crook. And uh, I'm going to talk about him briefly, because he's an example of what a good spy does. <laughs> uh, I met Alistair Crook 15 years ago in Jerusalem. And uh, he was a, he's, the, Brit the British Foreign Intelligence Service is called MI6. And uh, Alistair Crook, Work for MI6. He just, the Israelis didn't like him, so they leaked his name to an Israeli paper, and uh, so he was outed by the Israelis. That's why I'm showing his picture, and that's why I'm giving you his name. And the Israelis did that because as soon as he was outed and he was made public, he was finished as a spy. Anyway, I met him in Jerusalem and asked him what he'd been doing, and he said that he'd been in Gaza. Uh, working, doing round 
Gaza in a taxi speaking to uh, the Palestinian groups, Palestinian Liberation Organization, Islamic Jihad, Hamas, trying to negotiate, broker a ceasefire with the Israelis. And uh, at the time, I thought, this is ridiculous, this is improbable. The idea of a British spy wandering around Gaza in a taxi talking to Islamic Jihad. This is a guy, he's a fantasist. This is not real. But I went to Gaza and I spoke to Islamic Jihad and Hamas and People's Liberation, and they knew him. And it was true. He almost negotiated a ceasefire. And they only stopped because the Israelis dropped a bomb in a, an apartment building in the Gaza City, and the, the ceasefire didn't happen. So spies do good things. And it's important to make this point because people think because of the Snowden revelations that we're anti-intelligence, we're anti-spying. We're not. I understand we need spies, we need spies uh, to keep us, you know, to protect us from terror terrorism. We need them to combat international criminal groups. Uh, uh, this is the headquarters of MI6 in uh, London. Uh, this is the headquarters of GCHQ. This is the British equivalent of the National Security <coughs> Agency. Uh, it's one of the biggest uh, surveillance organizations in the world. Uh, the biggest is the Americans by far. Probably China after that. The Russians, but the British have got an enormous operation and they work really closely with the Americans. Edward Snowden worked for the National Security Agency and it was these documents that he leaked, but he also leaked them from the GCHQ as well. Um, now, I said that spies, lots of spies, people like Alison Krupp, do a good job, but that doesn't mean that in a democracy uh, you don't have to keep, you have to keep an eye on them, you have to watch them, that they don't exceed uh, the sort of bounds. Uh, you need political and judicial oversight of the spy agencies. I know that doesn't work in China, uh, and it, it doesn't work in Russia, but Britain and America are full-blown democracies, and uh, the spies are answerable to the citizens. So it's important that we maintain judicial and political oversight. Now, why do we need that? In the 1970s, uh, the American intelligence agencies, there's a, a senator called Frank Church, who was very courageous. And when he uh, was looking at the intelligence services in the 1970s, he discovered that the NSA and the FBI were investigating uh, people they regarded as anti-American or people who posed a threat to security. Uh, some of these people uh, were protesters, like uh, Vietnam protesters. They were journalists. They were trade union leaders. They were well-known terrorists, like uh, the civil rights leader Martin Luther King. Um, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali was regarded as a threat. So in the mall in Washington now, uh, there is only one statue to someone who's not been a president, and that's Martin Luther King. And yet Martin Luther King uh, was investiga under investigation by the NSA uh, and the FBI uh, in the 1930s. So that's an example of how if you don't watch the spies, uh, they can get out of control. In, the, in Britain, in the run-up to the Iraq war, the MI6 and the other agencies, Tony Blair wanted to go to war in Iraq alongside the Americans. So they doctored the intelligence information uh, in order to uh, uh, make a case to claim that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and this made the case for going to war in 2003. So that was only you know just over 10 years ago and we saw intelligence being abused. Now we come 
this was last year. This guy is James Clapper. He's the most senior intelligence guy in America. He's director of national intelligence. He, was, he appeared before a Senate hearing in uh, America, I think in April last year. And he was asked by a senator, do the intelligence agencies in America engage in the bulk collection of data of American citizens? And he said, no. He was telling a lie. And this is the first reason why when Snowden revealed these documents, one of the first things that we understood immediately was that the American intelligence agencies had been lying. He said they don't collect uh, the phone records, emails, Skype, Facebook of American citizens. Uh, Snowden revealed that that wasn't true. So the very first document that The Guardian published was a Verizon document. And it was a court order that had never been seen before, showing that uh, the court order gave uh, permission to the National Security Agency to collect uh, the phone records of uh, millions of Americans. Uh, the, uh, the telecom company was Verizon, a big company, in, telecom company in the States. But Others like AT&T were doing the same thing. Uh, this was a document that Snowden gave to The Guardian. Uh, it runs to about 10 pages, and it shows uh, uh, that you know, millions of American citizens were uh, their phone data was being handed over. And that phone data is important, because it tells you, you know, who you phoned, how long you spoke to them, uh, and to the spy agencies. Uh, they can tell a lot. The next document we produced was PRISM. And this is the logo that the National Security Agency used for PRISM. And this is one of the documents. And, this is, and why PRISM matters is it reveals that the NSA gets its information uh, from the major uh, internet uh, providers and from the social media. I know this is very technical. I'll just do it for five minutes and then I'll, uh, I'll move on. But you can see from here that there's sort of Gmail, Facebook, uh, Hotmail, Yahoo, Google, Skype, and all these companies uh, hand over, uh, if, if you're on Facebook, you use Skype, you use Gmail, then they say, we'll go to those companies and say, we want uh, uh, your data. And these companies, uh, they're obliged by law to hand it over. But before Snowden, uh, we didn't know this. We thought it happened, we thought it happened on a small scale. We didn't realize the full uh, extent to which it was happening. And here again, you can see these are all the, uh, you've got Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, PalTalk, YouTube, Skype, AOL, and Apple, all handing over your data. So if you think what you write in Facebook or uh, your emails are private, it's just not, you know, just not happening. And this was the Guardian when we published the story, it was the second scoop we had, and it shows the, uh, uh, you know, it's making clear the role of the internet agency. So we, our very first story was the Verizon one. Our second scoop was Prism. The Washington Post uh, published that the same day, a, a few minutes before The Guardian. Uh, the third story we did was about cyber security and the White House policy. And this, uh, we deliberately did the story in the day that uh, Xi Jinping was meeting Obama at the White House. Because up to that point, the Americans had been accusing the Chinese 
have aggressively engaged in cyber attacks in America. Uh, companies like Huawei, uh, the Americans uh, kept saying that Huawei uh, was engaged in all sorts of cyber spying. We get a secret copy of uh, the White House cyber security policy, and it showed that Americans till that point had said that cyber security was purely for defensive reasons. But in the secret document, it showed that the Americans were engaged in cyber hacking and cyber security for offensive reasons. Uh, they were just as aggressive as the Chinese. And um, you know, it was, so it was hypocritical. They had attacks on Huawei, but the Americans were doing exactly the same thing. Uh, if a computer was being sent from, say, America to a Chinese university, the NSA would intercept it uh, and put a bug into the back of the uh, computers so then they could to make it easier to listen in once they were uh, in China. If, they, if the, some of these computers were going to the People's Liberation Army, it must be really stupid to buy computers from the Americans, but they, 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 were, go, they were going, and these are the kind of things. So, and this was embarrassing for Obama the day that he was meeting uh, the Chinese leader and having to take questions from reporters uh, about cyber security. The, um, <coughs> the documents also revealed that, I mean, it's right that I'm not surprised that uh, America spies in China. I'm not surprised that America spies in Russia or spies in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's what you expect it to do. Uh, what surprised people was that uh, the Americans also spied on people that thought they were friends of America. Um, but Angela Merkel is the German Chancellor. And uh, when these stories appeared, uh, there was a lot of anger in Germany. So she reflected some of that. But she wasn't really personally upset. This again shows the hypocrisy of the political classes. She wasn't really upset until the Snowden documents revealed that the Americans were hacking her mobile phone. Once she discovered that they were hacking it and listening into her personal mobile phone calls, she got angry. The, this is a final technique technical point almost. The, uh, this is, this, one of the important things that the spy agencies say, look, this doesn't matter. We're not listening in to the actual phone calls. We're not reading emails. We're just looking at metadata. The metadata means they're looking at who you made the phone call to, and how long that phone call lasted. Uh, they're not looking at the content of emails, they're just looking to see who you sent the email to, uh, and maybe this, the top strat line. I, mean, I don't believe that. I am pretty sure that they do read the emails and they do listen to the content of phone calls. Uh, and this is their line. But the important thing is, you don't need the content. Spies don't trust content. Because if you write an email or make a phone call, you can be telling lies. But metadata is a fact. If you've made a phone call at a specific time uh, to a specific person, that's an unde undeniable fact. So metadata is more important than, uh, than the content. And by using just metadata, you can build up a picture of a personality very quickly. It's much more useful uh, than the, the content. If, at the opening ceremony, and again when I was talking about Snowden, I kept waving my iPhone about and saying, uh, you shouldn't trust it. And the, the part of the reason is you give away so much information on Facebook uh, and on emails, 
but also of all your electronic communications that are being used to build up a picture. And you might think, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why should I worry? But that, and you're giving it, you should think hard. Uh, supposing you're making a phone call to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, the spy agencies think, that person's got a drink problem. Or maybe someone's having an affair. Or they phoned an abortion clinic. Or, you know, there could be any number of things that the spy agencies will pick up and uh, build up a picture of you that may be misleading. I keep saying, and you don't realize how much information you're giving away. On this, who's got uh, iPhones? <laughs> Have you ever looked at the location button? Yeah. If you, if you want your way through to the location button, uh, and it's hidden quite far back, uh, you go to that. And it will list, it will show you a map of the locations that you've gone to most frequently. And um, uh, it'll give the time that you arrived there, how long you spent there. With, with that kind of information, it's so easy for them to help build up a picture. If you're at that location at a specific time, they know who else was at that location at a specific time. And they can work out who you met. It, that has consequences for journalists, because it help, it means they know who the, if they want to track the source of a story, it's easy for them to do. If you've, uh, if you're at a specific location, they can uh, do triangulation, they can work out from other people in the vicinity. Uh, if you've used a bike card, uh, if you've been a CCTV, if you, uh, it's so easy for them nowadays. 20 years ago, they couldn't have found the source of a story. It's not just journalists. They can listen in on a lawyer and uh, an alleged criminal. Uh, it could be a doctor and his uh, client. Uh, they do these things. Uh, we know this because of Snowden. Uh, there is no privacy uh, anymore. That's the technical stuff over. <coughs> This story went all over the, all around the world, and this was one from the South China Morning Post that uh, the the reaction it was a huge story in uh, America, it was a huge story in uh, Germany, a huge story in Brazil, Indonesia, Australia, but it wasn't a big story in Britain. And no one knows why. The Guardian reported it, but the BBC hardly touched it at all. And the other papers didn't touch it at all. And but some people said it's because the stories were too technical. But they weren't too technical for America. They weren't too technical for Hong Kong or Brazil. Or, and so I don't think, accept that as an explanation. It could be that the rest of the media just don't like The Guardian. Uh, they think that we're arrogant and smug and superior and, and uh, the Guardian before this was involved in uh, disclosing phone hacking by uh, journalists at the News of the World and uh, some of those journalists the, it, phone hacking is breaking the law and some of those journalists have uh, gone to jail. So a lot of uh, journalists, uh, the Rupert Murdoch papers in Britain, uh, blame The Guardian, A, for journalists going to jail, and B, because the news of the world closed down. It, it could be because people in Britain, when they think of spies, think of James Bond, uh, you know, Daniel Craig, and they've got a comfortable view. It may be because they're worried about Islamist terrorist attacks, and they think, well, we're glad the spies are there and we don't really care if it amounts to an invasion of privacy. These are legitimate positions. Uh, but it, it may be that Britain's been secure for 400 years. We haven't had a revolution or major upset. So people are comfortable with the idea of a security state. Now, I, I, I don't have an explanation for it. But it uh, so the reaction hasn't been uh, universal. 
I don't know how much reporting was done in China. It may have been suited China to present Snowden to show American hypocrisy. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was a big story in Hong Kong initially. The, the Guardian uh, was hammered for this story. Um, the, we were threatened with legal action. Uh, the committee destroyed the Guardian computers and uh, David Miranda, uh, Glenn Greenwell's partner, was held at uh, Heathrow Airport. So this was uh, Glenn Greenwell's partner, David Miranda, arriving back in Brazil after being held at uh, uh, Heathrow Airport for nine hours under the Terrorism Act. And uh, this is the deputy editor of The Guardian, Paul Johnson. Now it looks as if he's doing some do-it-yourself work, you know, doing some repairs in his house. But this was him. The intelligence services insisted that the Guardian destroy all the computers that contained the Snowden documents and destroyed, uh, had to destroy all our notebooks. Anything that touched Snowden had to be destroyed. And this was Paul Johnson, deputy editor of The Guardian, three hours in the Guardian basement with colleagues uh, reducing the computers to ru rubble. Uh, and this was us. Uh, we met Snowden again a few months ago in Moscow. Uh, this is the editor of The Guardian, Alan Rus Rusbridger. And despite all the pressure we were under, uh, he never buckled, and we've not finished with Snowden. Uh, we still have the documents, although they were destroyed in uh, London. Uh, we, had, we had copies in our New York office. They were told that we weren't allowed to have them in the New, the New York office. Uh, that legally, the Guardian's New York office is still part of the uh, British jurisdiction. Uh, so we asked the New York Times if they would keep the documents for us. And uh, they created a room in the, the New York Times office. It's very it's secure, it's got cameras, a security guard. You need pass, special passes to get in, into it. You need three different passes to access the computers. So it's pretty safe. But it's embarrassing as a British journalist from a country that supposedly believes in free speech, freedom of the press, that in order to report these documents, I have to go to New York, and I have to go into the New York Times office to carry out my work as a journalist. Uh, uh, so, almost the sort of final stage of this. I mean, what's happened is since, the, the answer is probably nothing very much. I mean, politically, there's been no real change. Uh, there's legislation going through Congress, uh, but it's been watered down. There's legislation being promised for Britain after the election next year. But I doubt the intelligence services in Britain show absolutely no sign whatsoever of offering concessions. Um, I don't think the NSA uh, has either. Uh, there are various court cases, the European uh, Court of Justice um, might bring change. The likeliest route for change will come uh, probably at the commercial level. If, you know, Facebook and uh, Gmail, all those companies have lost billions of dollars because as a result of these revelations. Uh, so they are mounting legal action against the NSA and the uh, legal challenge is saying we are not we are not obliged to hand over this material. Um, if we have to hand it over, we want you to be transparent, to make it clear why we're having to hand over this data and when uh, when we hand it over and how much. So that these changes are taking uh, place, and uh, as I've said before, 
uh, Google Gmail, they're now going to start offering encrypted uh, Gmail services. So, you know, there, there is some change taking place, it's minor. It, people need to get upset about this, and uh, it's, it's a hard job to get people to get worked up about it, especially in Europe. There's been various uh, attacks, uh, and because of what's happening in Syria, and Iraq, and the sort of threat of terrorist attacks on London or Paris or Berlin or the States, then it's hard in this particular climate to persuade people that you need corps, you need to sort of rein in the intelligence services, because people turn around and say, well, we're glad we're do they're doing that. We're glad that they're um, keeping tabs on Islamic terrorists. So it's a difficult climate to persuade people that privacy matters. And if you don't try and protect uh, privacy now, uh, you may turn around uh, in a few years' time and discover that it's, uh, it's too late. This has happened because of the change in technology in the last 20 years. Uh, it's allowed the intelligence agencies access to your information in a way that they never thought possible. They're not going to give that back. They're not going to stop uh, checking emails and phone records. Now they've got that power, they're not going to give it up. What we need is proper political oversight, proper judicial oversight, um, and I hope that's what's going to happen. And finally, I mean, all of this comes back to the bravery of one individual. Uh, one individual that thought things were wrong and uh, he had the courage to be a whistleblower. And uh, he's paid a price for it. He's living in Moscow. And uh, he wishes he wasn't there, uh, but he's glad to get this debate underway. And I'll take your questions. I know that your colleague Laura has made a documentary about Edward Snowden. It's called Citizen 4. So could you please tell us something about this documentary and any chance we can watch it in Hong Kong? Uh, I think you know, any journalism student should see uh, Laura's film. It's called uh, Citizen 4. I, and I'm not saying you should see it because I'm in it. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm only in it briefly anyway. Uh, what it does, she sets out uh, the first section deals with whistleblowers before Snowden. Uh, there's a guy called William Binney who worked for the NSA and uh, was a whistleblower about 10 years before uh, Snowden. And uh, she talks about that director of national intelligence, James Clapper, and how he and why and how he lied to Congress. So she's basically just setting the scene. And then about a, one hour of the two-hour documentary is set in Hong Kong, mainly in the Mira Hotel. Uh, and she, Laura shot everything from the first minute she met Snowden until he left the Mira Hotel, Laura filmed something like 20 hours worth of uh, footage, and she's condensed that to one hour. And so she shows uh, things in uh, Hong Kong, like Stone put the red hood over his head, and, uh, and it shows the tension in the room. I mean, at one point, you know, when the fire alarm goes off, and Snowden um, is wondering whether it's an attempt to try and get him out of the room. And it shows, it shows him sort of debating whether to leave the room or um, you know, stay, whether it's a false alarm or whether it's real. Um, and it shows him just before he leaves the Mira Hotel uh, to get to hiding in Hong Kong. And then the, the final section 
uh, deals with Snowden uh, and what happened to him subsequently. Some of it shows him in Moscow and it revealed for the first time that his girlfriend, Lindsay Mills, who everybody thought was mad with him for uh, leaving her in Hawaii, is actually in Moscow. So <coughs> the film is basically uh, the story of Edward Snowden. Um, but there's quite a bit there about how journalists work, and uh, I did recommend that all of you, uh, if you get the chance, see it, maybe even show it here. It's o it opened in America last Friday. It opens in Britain today, and it will definitely be shown in Hong Kong in, in the next few weeks. Thank you. Uh, I know that Twitter uh, recently is suing the Department of Justice for uh, the government asked Twitter to give a user's information but did not allow Twitter to tell the public that they are doing so. So uh, as you mentioned before, the technology uh, companies, they are uh, giving users information to the department. Uh, so my question is, what's the stance of the uh, technology uh, companies after uh, Snowden's uh, issues coming out and uh, what so as far as I come through they are in the middle of these two sides so quite embarrassed so what's your position position thank you this is a really good question uh, and it's at the it's at the heart of the whole thing and um, when the students revelations first came out, the telecom and internet companies, their initial response was, we don't know anything about this. Uh, we've never heard of PRISM, which is probably true. They, they probably didn't know that it was called that. Uh, but they gave the impression that they didn't know much about this. And now we know that actually they do know lots about it. And uh, their argument was, uh, there's nothing they could do about it. The Amer American law and British law is that the telecom and internet companies have to hand over the data to the NSA and GCHQ. They're served with a warrant to hand over this material. Uh, but these warrants are, it's not a warrant for an individual like they want to check you. These warrants are broad. Uh, the, the telecom companies like Verizon and AT&T have been co cooperating with the intelligence services for 30 or 40 years. The new bit is the internet companies like Facebook and uh, Google and Microsoft. Uh, and they've been handing over this without telling their customers. And they say they're, they're not allowed to. Uh, when they've been served the warrant, they hand over the material, but they're not allowed to tell anybody about the warrant. Twitter have been better than Facebook and Microsoft than the others, because Twitter tried to resist, um, and as you say, they've launched the case. And some small companies, uh, there's a, it's called Lavabit, L-A-V-A-B-I-T, was an internet provider and uh, the, in, the NSA served a warrant, warrant on the owner of Lavabit and said, you have to hand over your uh, data. And he was extremely brave. He says, uh, I, can under, I don't mind handing over data if it's related to a terrorism case, but I'm not going to hand over the keys, uh, the encryption keys of every individual that uses uh, Lavabit, his internet provider. And because uh, he had a choice, he ha had to either hand over the data to the NSA or close his company. So he closed his company. And he's involved in a court action uh, at present. So it's a very difficult issue. Uh, one of the internet companies, the internet companies kept saying, uh, 
this isn't our fault. As you said, you know, we're caught in the middle. We are innocent. Uh, but when I spoke to the internet companies, and just to get some basic information, uh, they were so evasive. They were so suspicious. Uh, they were withholding so much information. That made me wonder about just how heavily involved they are. Um, one of the companies, I said, how much money do you get from the NSA every year for uh, co cooperating? And they said, uh, we're not telling you. But I says, we have a right to know. And they said, well, if I told you how much money we get from the NSA, it would seem like a lot of money to you. <laughs> uh, but it's not a lot of money to us. So, so that we still haven't got an answer. The exact, you know, exactly what the relationship is between uh, these uh, companies and the intelligence agents. The documents that Snowden gave to us, as I've said many times over the last few days, um, tens of thousands of documents, and the incredible detail about what's happening in Afghanistan. The one detail he hasn't given us uh, is the code names for the telecom uh, companies. Uh, and it's so deeply guarded because those telecom companies are so important to the NSA and GCHQ. Uh, they, they, the main part of their work is not listening stations in Afghanistan or Iraq, but the cooperation of the telecom and internet companies. If they didn't have that cooperation, they would lose the bulk of their uh, ability uh, to conduct surveillance. Um, uh, all along you have been mentioning uh, British spy or national spies. How about freelance spies? They, they are even more dangerous, isn't it? They work for money, they will do whatever country or organization give them money to? There's, a, there's two levels in spying. Uh, the, you have the sort of CIA and say MI6, and the sort of, they have full-time spies uh, you know, that work from London or Washington. But they, they run agents, uh, and the agents are, as you say, freelance people that could work for both sides, sources that are uh, unpredictable or unreliable. Um, but you know, people like, say, Alistair Crook, that uh, they're spies that have been trained and they're answerable uh, to their bosses, but quite often, uh, they're just dependent on a whole range of sources. These sources could be journalists, uh, um, you know, people, as you say, in it for the money. Uh, but they're just gathering that information. The people that matter are the people that process it. And uh, the kind of people you're talking about are regarded as a low level, uh, unreliable, untrustworthy. Um, the, the bulk of uh, intelligence gathering now is not human. Uh, they, they, according to the Americans and the British, they rely mainly on the NSA and GCHQ. They rely on surveillance uh, for the bulk of their information. Um, and that's one of the arguments. People say, uh, people who are critical of the intelligence services say the best spy sources are human sources. Uh, individual contact, uh, people uh, dotted around the country that provide, uh, prepared to, uh, provide information. And they argue that surveillance, mass surveillance doesn't work. You gather all this information and you can't process it. There's so much information you can't go through it. So what you should do is have targeted surveillance. You just, if you've got someone you suspect you direct your surveillance at that particular person. In the run up to 9-11, uh, they had the information beforehand uh, that some of the hijackers were in America. But the, 
the information that the NSA collected was not passed on to the FBI, so it was never acted on. They had the information, but there was a lack of communication, uh, inability to process it. And again, it comes back, some people again argue it's better just to rely on some human contact, um, the old fashioned way of spying rather than lies. The kind of people you're talking about, freelancers, are, uh, are, they're, not, they're not taken seriously. Is that what you meant? Yeah, just following on from that, um, to what extent do journalists co cooperate with the intelligence agencies like CIA and, um, and how, this is a three part question. Uh, second one is um, how dangerous does that make it for journalists in places like Iraq because quite often journalists are accused of being spies. And just finally for the students in the room, what advice would you give them if they were approached by a, an intelligence agency? <laughs> Which can happen actually, folks, you'd be surprised. The, uh, there's a big difference between Britain and America. In Britain, the spy agencies are really secretive. In America, the CIA have got a press office. You can phone them up. Any of us can phone them up uh, if you're a journalist to get information. So the Americans tend to be a bit more open uh, than Britain. Uh, in Britain, on each paper, uh, there's one designated journalist that they will speak to. They, they won't speak. If you phone up, try to speak to MI6 or uh, MI5 or GCHQ, they won't speak to you. There's one designated person reporter in each paper that they will speak to. And I find it really difficult dealing with the intelligence agencies. If you're talking to say the police or a politician or a social worker, you can check that information. You can go and speak to someone else and double check whether it's true. With the intelligence agencies, you can't double check. You either believe what they're telling you um, or you don't use the material. If you, and they make it difficult for you, it'd be easy if you say, um, MI6 claims there's a major intelligence plot underway in Britain, but they won't allow you to say that the information came from MI6. They won't let you say the information came from intelligence agencies. They won't let you say something even vague like government sources. You're not allowed to attribute that information. The same with the uh, CIA. Uh, you're not allowed to say the CIA said, um, unless it's some bland official statement denying a story. So it, it's difficult for journalists dealing with spies because they, they won't uh, go on the record. Um, It's a real danger uh, all around the world because a lot of the things that spies do are the same things that journalists do. Uh, you're trying to get information and you're using the same techniques and you're um, speaking to the same kind of people. So the, the distinction between uh, journalists and spies, uh, at least superficially, is very small. Uh, the problem is in a lot of uh, countries, um, that that sort of distinction is lost, and uh, as Eric says, uh, in places like Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, especially if you're an American or a British, uh, if you're a journalist and you're caught by, say, the Taliban or Islamic State or uh, Al Qaeda or uh, some of the Syrian groups or in Africa, uh, and you claim you're a journalist. And they look at stories. I suppose they look at stories I've written about spies and intelligence. And, uh, you know that distinction's lost, and quite a lot. It happens a lot that uh, you know, journalists will accuse, be accused of being uh, uh, spies. Um, I think it's a problem. I'm not that familiar with China. I worked there for one year, as I've said before, 
I'm not that familiar with China, but when I was there years ago, and this is decades ago, uh, the Chinese government's attitude was that even information that would be basic in any other country, like say information about say the non coal, coal production in uh, China, that was regarded as official information in the, 1980, in the 1980s. And uh, if you disclosed it without approval, then that was regarded as a, a breach of uh, official secrets. And I remember a journalist in China in the 1980s uh, losing his job and being prosecuted for um, disclosing something as mundane as that. Uh, I don't know if it still happens to the same extent. It's hard to believe that it would, but who, who knows? Um, it, it was, so just that final point on that. <laughs> it's a difficult one how to respond to, uh, if you're approached by a spy, a spy is a source. Um, I, I've met spies down the years in different countries, and some of them are totally crazy. And I think, what, how on earth is this person a spy? You, know, that you meet people who get real mental, temperamental, psychological difficulties, and you think, why on earth is the CIA uh, employing this person? Um, and then you meet people like Alistair Crook, who you think, this is a serious person, gets serious information, is worth listening to. Uh, so you have to make the judgment yourself. But as a young journalist, uh, my advice to you, if you're approached by anyone from the intelligence agencies, is to stay clear of them. Don't get involved. Especially when you're young, uh, they like to recruit journalists. They're a great source. Because the distinction between journalists and spies is so small, uh, being a journalist is a good cover for wandering around asking questions in sensitive places. Uh, and we're told in Britain that in every organization, in every newspaper, in every television company, there's at least one person that works for the intelligence agencies. And the, on The Guardian, we're all always trying to work out who it might be. <laughs> So we get uh, two more questions. We have their chance for the people at the back. Hi, good morning, Mr. McCaskey. Uh, I know that a few days earlier there was an Occupy London happened in London, and uh, the Guardian did a lot of report on this, but the BBC did not just uh, maybe cover a little. Do you think this is because of the government intervention? And uh, if so, do you? London. London. Yeah, and uh, do you think this is uh, related to government intervention? If so, do you think this will harm the freedom and the, of journalism? And uh, also on 19th uh, of, of October, when Guardian was reporting this uh, protest, it says this protest is a support of Hong Kong protest, but actually, according to the organization. They just uh, say this is a global movement, uh, nothing to do with the uh, Hong Kong protest. So I noticed that a few days later, the Guardian changed the word. Do you think this is uh, maybe a mistake? Uh, if so, do you think this will uh, have something to do about the accuracy of the news? Thank you. Uh, I, I just uh, checked their website and they say uh, Occupy London is a global movement. Uh, they fight for a better economy and a equal society. Thank you. The, uh, I think the BBC is one of the best uh, news organizations news organizations in the world. Um, they're not very good on uh, sort of breaking stories. I mean, they tend to be mainly, you know, reporting what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis and giving context. Um, there's a former head of news at the BBC, Richard Sambrook. He's now professor of uh, journalism at Cardiff University. 
And he said that if Snowden had come to the BBC, uh, uh, they wouldn't have reported it. Uh, because the BBC is still too cautious, still too careful. Um, on the Snowden stuff, the BBC hardly reported it at all. Um, and the Guardian offered to give them the documents, uh, and they didn't want them. Um, whenever I say this about the BBC, and BBC journalists are present, uh, they get angry with me and dispute this. But if you look at the BBC's coverage, uh, it's, um, it's minimal. When I said that this isn't a story in Britain, uh, if, if you went out into the streets in Britain and mentioned Edward Snowden, they wouldn't know who he was. The, and that's because of the BBC. Because the BBC didn't report it, then it doesn't exist. Um, the BBC, again, is very, very cautious. I don't know the background to the Occupy uh, London. Uh, Occupy, the Occupy movement in, uh, um, maybe they just thought it was too small. Uh, it w was it Occupy related to the protests in Hong Kong? No, was it the Occupy movement like the one in New York? I, I, so I don't know the background to it, so I'd be misleading you if I attempted to answer it. Uh, we, we get the last uh, questions. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, you said even an iPhone can be used as a microphone for surveillance, even when it is not in use. So as a working journalist, what is the most important thing, or the two, three most important factors that a working journalist should take care of to guard his privacy and the secrecy of his sources? Since the Snowden revelations, the Guardian, uh, the Guardian has changed the practice for journalists, and we are all now uh, much more security con conscious. If I was going to see the editor or deputy editor and news editor to talk about something sensitive, the first thing we do is we take our iPhones and take them out of the room. If we're having a conversation, we don't. Uh, and now. We do proper encryption uh, to get into the phone. Do you use a two-step encryption? Uh, you know, on your laptop, uh, you put in your normal password. Um, but you know, theoretically, um, you need a sort of backup where uh, you know, in order to access it, you need uh, um, sort of verification uh, through your mobile as well. So in order to access your laptop, you also need a message from uh, your phone. So we're also using sort of encrypted, uh, long encryption, uh, using uh, encrypted emails, uh, chat. So the Guardian gave us two books. Uh, this is one. Uh, uh, guardian, guardian your data. And it gives <laughs> basic. Uh, uh, it gives you basic advice on how to protect uh, your laptops, your iPhones, uh, and all the rest of it. And um, so, I, I, it's the only copy I've got. I'm happy to leave it here if anybody wants to uh, photocopy it. And, uh, <laughs> but it gives you sort of, you know, just that basic. Uh, uh, why I need a good password. <laughs> How do I keep data safe in an open plan office? Uh, 
uh, how do I work safely outside the office? It's, it's all your know, basic... Um, This is also uh, in, you know, practical information um, you know, related to Stone that the Guardian gave to all the journalists as well. Um, so, yeah, on the very first day I was here at the opening ceremony, I mean, the biggest message I could give to any journalist now is uh, beware of electronic communications uh, get proper encryption uh, on your laptops and uh, your, for your iPhone. Uh, we're all doing it now. Uh, use Tor and PGP. And uh, if you're meeting a source, uh, go back to the old-fashioned pen and paper and meet them face to face. If, if this is uh, my last point, there's something wonderful in this book. The Guardian. Uh, and the editor, Alan Rudspicher, was under huge pressure uh, last October, November. The British press didn't support us. We got, um, the government was threatening to close us down, or at least close down our reporting. Um, and the intelligence services were saying that we've done enormous damage to their capability. And uh, the Daily Mail, uh, a British paper, uh, put a picture on its front page uh, of the editor, uh, Alan Rudspicher, put his picture on the front page with the headline across the front was traitor. <coughs> uh, that's the kind of pressure we were under. The next day, and some of the responses are in this book, we received 30 letters or emails of support from the major newspapers around the world, New York Times, Washington Post, papers in Japan, uh, Turkey, Germany, uh, editors saying, we support The Guardian. Uh, it's important uh, that uh, the intelligence agencies are held to account and it's necessary that you need a free press to hold the intelligence agencies to account. And it's very hard as a Guardian journalist not to read these and feel emotional. Um, and then the final point, the director of national intelligence who told the lie uh, to Congress, uh, this is a quote from him. Um, he says, he's unhappy at the idea of giving any credit to Edward Snowden or The Guardian or anybody else. Um, but he does go on to say, I think it's clear that some of the conversations that this has generated, some of this debate actually needed to happen. So Clapper is acknowledging um, that he's glad that we had this debate about surveillance. The um, the director of the British spying service, GCHQ, retired two weeks ago. And he said that uh, Snowden, he didn't mention Snowden, he didn't mention The Guardian, but when you read his speech, you know that he meant us. He said this had caused enormous damage, but he understood why it was necessary. Uh, although he thought it did enormous damage, the important thing was in Britain, that you had free, a free press. That's what, as head of the GCHQ, he was fighting for democracy in Britain. He was fighting uh, for the right to a free press. So maybe that's the difference from between the US and Britain and China and Russia, uh, where despite all the flaws, and despite you know holding them to account, uh, we still have a free press. Now, uh, let's move on to our second speaker, uh, Mr. Curtis Lee. 
Everybody, please be seated. Now we have uh, our 
our second speaker, Mr. Curtis Lee, uh, who, who will be talking on guns in America. Thank you so much. Thank guys a little bit about gun culture in the United States. Um, I was a part of the team two years ago that had covered a mass shooting um, at the Aurora Theater shooting, and I also um, covered Newtown as well. That was, 2012 was an interesting year. There were a number of shootings uh, around the country, and it really kind of elevated the discourse in terms of, um, of gun culture and, and how guns are viewed in the U.S. It's, uh, it's all too often that mass shootings occur in the U.S. I mean, even on Friday, there was one outside of Seattle where um, at a school, a shooting occurred and three people died. But I think that the issue with guns is every day. It's not just mass shootings. It's in, it's in cities all across the country each and every day. Uh, I mean, someone right now might be getting killed. Is probably dying from a gunshot wound in an American city as we speak. Um, on a hospital bed or, or in, a street, in the streets. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the mass shootings that have occurred and, and kind of where we are in the discourse right now. So like I said, two years ago, more than a dozen mass shootings played in the country. And when I say mass shootings, I'm talking multiple deaths. Um, you know, five to, to 12 people, to 13 people uh, maybe killed in one single incident. And uh, two of those shootings, uh, like I said, were at, at the Aurora Theater um, in July. And then five months later, it was at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, where 20 first graders were killed by, by a lone gunman. Hundreds of people were killed in those shootings, and it, and it really, like I said, elevated the discourse over guns in the US. And the issue over guns is very much a political issue in the US. When you, when you talk about what reforms might come about, it really boils down to politics. Um, it, there's a two-party system in the US, Democrats and Republicans. And this is very much much kind of an issue that, that, that both sides see, see very differently. So gun laws across the country, each state has different gun laws. Different gun laws in Colorado, from different gun laws in California to Pennsylvania to New Jersey to Florida. Each state has very different sets of gun laws. And those laws do everything from limit ammunition magazines. Those are what you essentially put into a gun. They hold the bullets and whatnot. So you can get magazine rounds of, or ammunition magazines of 10 rounds, 15 rounds, 100 rounds. Um, that's what James Holmes, the gunman in the Aurora Theater shooting carried. He had a 100 round. Uh, drum kind of magazine that fit into a, an assault style weapon. Also background checks are required across the country, but there's certain loopholes that, that people get through. So if I go to a store like a Walmart or a Target, I have to have a background check. They, they'll run a background check on me, make sure I'm not a criminal, I'm not a felon, I don't have any prior convictions. But there's easy ways in the US that, to get around that. And that, that happens all too often when, say, I have a gun and I want to give you a gun. I know you and I can sell you that gun and I don't necessarily have to do that background check on you because I think I trust you. Uh, family members, you sell a family member a gun, give a family member a gun. You're not doing background checks on those individuals. You're just kind of uh, doing it on merits. You're, you're trusting that they won't do something with those guns and, and, and commit a crime or anything like that. So the, the, the law is very, very, very much by states uh, in the US. Federal legislation um, is very thin in the US. There's something called the Brady Act, which mandates those certain background check requirements. So say I go into a store to buy a gun, they're going to run a quick background check on me. That's kind of covered under the Brady Act. There was also a bill in 2004 that, that expired. It was called the Assault Weapons Ban. And that banned high, high capacity, high powered military kind of war weapons. Those are weapons that, that you see on the battlefield, these AK-47s, AR-15s, those kind of assault style weapons that, that are used to, to fire multiple bullets uh, very quickly. I mean, you just put your hand on the trigger and it very much like that, military style rifles. Um, and th that assault weapons ban expired in 2004. And there were politics behind that, why it expired. Um, 
So a lot of the gun legislation at the federal level is widely viewed as symbolic. The, the, the bills that come out of Washington in terms of gun legislation are, are essentially toothless pieces of legislation. They, they don't do much. They're, they're viewed as kind of like, oh, there's some gun laws and okay, whatever. No one's really gonna abide by them. They, they don't have too much bite to them. So it's really left on the states, each state in the US to kind of enact their own laws. But when the law is different from state to state, I mean, you can easily travel from state to state in the US and, and gun laws in one state might differ six hours away in another state or 30 minutes away across a bridge in another state. So, so it's very much hit or miss in the US in, in terms of gun laws. So after the Aurora Theater shooting and, and Newtown in 2012, I mean, if you, if you saw these shootings or heard about these shootings and you're in the US, it really hit a, hit a, hit a nerve with folks. And there was a discussion after, after the shootings, should more laws be passed? Would more reforms have helped prevent these shootings? Would they not have? Why do we need more laws? We do need more laws because, and this is just me speaking of, of what people are saying, we do need more laws because it might protect lives. People say that, well, these gun laws would have done nothing. These individuals bought these guns legally. Um, we need to address things like mental health instead. We need, to, we need to have better parenting at home. We need to have kids able to talk to their parents instead of going to pick up a weapon and go to school when they're upset with someone. So it really, it really elevated this, uh, the, the discussion over gun laws. And it, it's very much divided in the US along party lines, Democrats and Republicans. So after Newtown, occurred, President Obama, who's a Democrat, really called for stricter gun laws. And when we say stricter gun laws, he was calling more for something called universal background checks on all sales and transfers of guns, like a federal mandate on that. Something where I have a gun, you're my friend, we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do a background check on you because, hey, I, it's just the law. And that gets through certain loopholes like straw purchases, which which are kind of under the cover, kind of black sales of guns, it, 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 black market sales of guns. That's what it's aimed to really cut back on. So there was a push in Washington in January of 2013 to pass stricter gun laws. Joe Biden was kind of tasked with that. That's Vice President Joe Biden. He was really tasked with getting this law passed in, in Congress. So a bill was presented in the US Senate, and, um, and, and Democrats controlled the US Senate, but it, it went nowhere. Um, because a lot of people are, are concerned that gun laws can hurt their future political ambitions because there's a lot of organizations out there who have vested interests in guns in the US and there's, there's other groups who are trying to, to, compact, to, to, to have more gun control and, and combat, combat certain, these certain groups. But it very much is, falls along party lines. Democrats often support more gun, reform, gun control, gun legislation. Republicans say, you know, it's not needed. We have a Second Amendment right in the US Constitution, and that right is to bear arms. And we shouldn't have laws that infringe upon those rights. We should be able to have any kind of magazines that we want. We should be able to, um, we don't need to have background checks for every person. We should be able to have a free society, possess guns, and, and not have many laws on those, uh, bearing, bearing on those laws. <clears throat> so, so, once that bill died in the US Senate, the, the federal reforms to, to have stricter gun laws, it really was left on the states. And at a handful of states in 2013, Colorado, Connecticut, New York, Maryland, very much less than, less than 10 states passed stricter gun laws in the wake of those shootings in 2012. And like I said, there were a number of shootings in 2012. There were more than a dozen mass shootings. And those in Colorado, for example, I covered the, the theater shooting but it, Colorado is also the site of a, a number of other, sh uh, another shooting. 1999, there was a Columbine shooting um, in which 13, 12 students were killed and one teacher um, at, at a suburban high school in sub suburban Denver. And in January 2013, Democrats control the political landscape in Colorado. Each, each state has a state legislature, and it's a body, it's a governing body that, that creates laws for those states. So in Colorado, Democrats decided to say, hey, we need to do something about this. This is an issue in Colorado. This is an issue in America. People in Washington and Congress aren't passing laws. So hey, we're going to pass laws here in Colorado. And lawmakers stepped forward and presented a package of gun control bills, bills that would make, make it tougher to access weapons, make it tougher to, to have high capacity magazines, 
And the thought behind some of these, some of these bills, for example, limiting ammunition magazines to 15 rounds. Say a shooter walks into the room and they have a 15 round magazine. Once that's over, once he, that shooter, he or she is done shooting, they have to stop and reload that weapon. And that might give people the time to maybe run, get away, someone might step forward and tackle the shooter as the shooter is loading another uh, magazine. But, but by limiting the magazines, it, uh, it allows people, it, it doesn't allow the shooter to have that many weapons. That, that was an argument that people said that, that, that they felt that the bill was needed for. And other, bi other bills that were passed were universal background checks and making people pay for those background checks. If you want to sell a gun to someone and you have to run the background check and you're going to have to pay for it, you're going to have to pay a little tax. So it was very much a tax on, on running background checks on people uh, who are selling guns. So those are some of, the, some of the bills that were passed in Colorado. And Colorado is very much a hunting kind of state. I mean, this is a state that people love their guns. People like to go out right now in October, in November, <laughs> go to the woods, shoot deer, shoot elk, shoot, shoot whatever, you know, and eat it. <laughs> Birds, all sorts, of, all sorts of stuff, right? There, all, right. Uh, all sorts of stuff. Birds, those sorts of things. And it's also a state where people like to have ma ammunition magazines of more than 15 rounds in their guns. They like to have 20 and 30, 30 round magazines because they like to do something called sport shooting, target shooting. That's when you go to the range and you have a bullseye ahead of you, and you just unload on it, and you try and do target practice, and you try and you know hit the target, and you want to shoot as many times as you can. So it's something called sport shooting, and a lot of people do do sport shooting in the U.S. It's it's something that that people really enjoy. So the argument from Republicans was really very much like these laws aren't needed. These laws wouldn't have prevented James Holmes from walking into a theater and killing 12 people and injuring 70 others. He, James Holmes legally purchased all of those guns. He passed background checks at the store uh, to buy his guns. He legally bought all of the ammunition. Um, sure, in Colorado at the time, you were able to have very large ammunition magazines. So he had 25, 30 rounds, 100 round magazines and was able to really um, you know, shoot hundreds of rounds in a very sm short amount of time with his, with his assault weapon. So that kind of happened right after the theater shooting in January 2013. Stricter laws were passed. And like I said, Congress didn't really do much. And, and even though Democrats control the US Senate, there's certain Democrats that represent states that are very kind of conservative, though, as well, that have a lot of Republicans. States like Louisiana in the South, states like Arkansas as well, where people are very much you know, against gun control. They, they do not support having stricter reforms because, I mean, there's parts of the U.S. that people really love their guns. People have multiple guns. They have, you know, a hundred guns. They have showcases full of guns because they like to show them off. Guns from the, the 1800s, guns from, you know, the 1990s, all sorts of guns uh, that, that individuals like to possess and don't feel that they need to be told by the U.S. government how to, how to use their guns because it goes back to having those constitutional rights to, to, to bear arms. So Coloradans, um, it was a very toxic, very, very bitter debate among Democrats and Republicans at the state legislature. Um, again, Republicans called it an infringement on their freedoms. Democrats said it was necessary to save lives. Um, and you saw a lot of victims, family members from past shootings. Uh, if you guys saw my other uh, slides, Tom Sullivan, his son Alex, was killed in the theater shooting, and he, he testified at the Capitol quite a bit. Um, and he, he was very emotional about, with his testimony, saying, you know, if James Holmes didn't have all of these weapons, my son might still be alive. My son might have been able to get out of that theater. And other people came forward and said, you know, hey, these, these reforms are needed. There were also groups that traveled to Colorado to say, no, they're not needed. And here's why. Because because James Holmes did pass the background check and things like that. And, um, and, and, and it was very, very a very contentious debate there at the Capitol. And going, going back to kind of what I talked about with some Democrats voting for laws that maybe their constituents might not feel are needed, there were a handful of Democrats in Colorado who lost their jobs after that legislative session in 2013. They were booted out of office in, in something called recall elections. 
that those are special elections that are held by constituents in Colorado um, because because they felt like their 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 elected officials did not vote in their best interest. They said, you know, no, we don't need stricter reforms, and you voted for stricter gun laws. We don't want you in office, so we're going to hold a special election. And individuals were recalled; they were thrown out of office and replaced with new new um, new politicians who the voters felt. Um, we're voting in their best interests and we're supporting them in their best interests. In Colorado and states all across the country, you, the voters have the ability to hold recall elections and boot their elected officials out of office if they feel the need to. And that's what happened to three lawmakers in Colorado, three Democrats who voted for these stricter gun laws, uh, limits on ammunition magazines, background checks, fees for background checks. Those things um, that they voted for uh, essentially led to them being thrown out of office. And in the U.S., a, a powerful, powerful group that's behind a lot of this stuff and comes to the states when there's new gun control on the table is a group called the National Rifle Association, also known as the NRA. And they're very much anti-gun control. Um, they, they're, they're, they staunchly oppose um, gun laws, gun laws that limit the right to bear arms. They, they are a very powerful, big money organization who will essentially grade politicians on how they vote on gun control and hold them accountable when elections come about. And what they do in elections is they spend a lot of money attacking candidates and also boosting them up to try and get people to vote for that candidate and support them. So one thing the NRA does, um, and they came to Colorado quite a bit and, and, and they were behind some of the recall elections in Colorado um, that threw out some of those Democratic lawmakers. They felt like, you know, we're going to organize the people. We're going to get the people behind this to, to recall these people, these lawmakers, because they didn't. They they're infringing on people's freedoms to to have any kind of gun and any kind of magazine ammunition that they want. So a lot of times, the NRA grades politicians, and it, and it reflects their their view of how each has voted on gun legislation. Politicians with strong ratings may benefit financially with campaign contributions. Those with weak ratings may be subject to negative ads in an election, et cetera. So in A, you're pretty good. You're, I'll show you a map that the New York Times has um, of the country. So this is the US, and the NRA grades different politicians. So here's Colorado right here. And we'll click here on Cory Gardner. He's a representative from Eastern Colorado. And he has, he's a Republican, and he has an A grade. Um, that means that he he doesn't support gun control. He doesn't think that more gun gun laws are needed after mass shootings or anything like that. He says, you know, no, people ha should have their own freedoms, have their rights. Everyone's not a criminal who buys a gun, and and everyone people should have more freedom. So the NRA gives him an A rating. He's a good guy to them. He he's a guy that will support in an election. We'll give him money. We'll give him campaign donations. And you see right here, this is back in 20, 2012. He was running in a very um, easy race, so they only gave him $1,000. He was going to win the race in, anyways. Usually, if it's a competitive race uh, election, they will spend tens of millions of dollars supporting a candidate through advertising, through, uh, through help with their campaign, through negative advertising toward another candidate that might be challenging that individual. So they're, they're very much kind of a, a back political player in the US. So when you go here, Jared Polis, He's from Boulder. He's a Democrat. He, um, he was actually very vocal for gun control laws after the theater shooting, after Newtown, after the Sikh shooting in Wisconsin. He called for more laws uh, to be passed and enacted in Congress. And you see they give him an F rating. And if you look at certain parts of the country, some, some states, everyone has a, has a good rating from the NRA. These are usually much more conservative kinds of states, um, states that, that uh, that really, kind of southern states that, that, that people really hold on to their guns and really enjoy their guns. If you look at Kansas right here, every, every politician has an A rating. Oklahoma, every politician has an A rating. Much of Texas, most politicians have A ratings there as well. So what the NRA does, um, let me go back here. The NRA grades those politicians um, and, and provides financial support to individuals. They, they do advertising and things like that. So right now, the US on Tuesday, 
we'll have a big election in the United States, the midterm elections. These are the congressional elections. Uh, new, new lawmakers will, will go to the Senate and to the House. There's, it's not a presidential year. That's in, a, in two years. But um, there's a lot at stake in this next election because the, the US Congress is, 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 could, be could be taken over by Republicans. Republicans um, could be in the majority in the US Congress. And then that means President Obama, who's a Democrat, will have to work with Republicans. And it'll just cause more gridlock. And it's likely they won't work together. So the NRA is running a lot of ads right now in the US. To this day, right now, they're running ads helping candidates um, in certain competitive races. And Cory Gardner in Colorado, he was the congressman that I showed you who got an A grade uh, from the NRA. He's running for US Senate this year. Very competitive race against uh, Democrat Mark Udall in Colorado. And the NRA is showing ads um, daily um, on TV, TV ads that are really boosting up Cory Gardner and, and wanting people to support him and, and wanting voters to, 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 to back him as a candidate when they cast their ballots on Tuesday. So this is one of the ads that, that are airing, uh, quite a, that's airing quite a bit in Colorado right now. Hope the volume's OK. Turn it up a little. Our second amendment rights are under attack. OK. Yeah. Um, it worked well yesterday. Let's try it one more time. OK, probably not that. Um, Our second amendment right to render or attack Keep buffering. by the uh, um, Obama Maybe, amendment. hold on, I'll just Google it. I'll go to YouTube real quick. Bear with me real quick. Um, okay, so this is the ad right here. Hopefully this will work. Our Second Amendment rights are under attack by the Obama administration and Senator Mark Udall. That's why we need leaders like Cory Gardner in the U.S. Senate to fight back for us. In Colorado, Gardner introduced legislation to protect our Second Amendment rights. In the Senate, he'll stand up against their extreme gun control agenda. And that's why the NRA is proud to support Cory Gardner for United States Senate. The NRA Political Victory Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. So that's an ad that's running quite a bit in Colorado right now. And, and, and if you notice what they said, they said um, the Obama administration and make, making the Obama administration seem really eerie and also saying um, the Democrats in control of the Senate, they have this this kind of extreme gun control agenda, this agenda that will will take away your right to bear arms. And you see, see the guy with the shotgun over his arm. And I, do, I, do I think that these ads are having an influence? I don't know. A lot of people already have their minds made up about gun issues, usually. But what they're trying to do is kind of, you know, if there are people kind of on the edge there who are thinking about, you know, maybe should I support Udall? Should I support Gardner? Oh, well, well, Gar well if Gardner is a guy who who won't take away my guns, and, and really trying to maybe go for the naive kind of voters in elections who aren't always paying attention, um, who are just tuning in right now three or four days before the election is about to uh, be held. And, um, and, and, and that's an ad that is on constant loop in the US right now, at least in Colorado, as well as in other states. The NRA runs those similar ads for other candidates around the country. But there are groups who are trying to combat the NRA. But the NRA is a very powerful group. It's a group that's been around since the 1800s. It's a group that has a lot of roots in communities. It has a lot of money as well. Um, and there are pro-gun control groups that are backing candidates who support stricter reforms. Um, former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, uh, in 2011, she was holding a community town hall meeting in, in Arizona outside of her, um, in her district, outside of a grocery store, meeting with constituents, people who who voted for her. She's just meeting with them, hearing their concerns, and she's going to go back to Washington and fight for them. A guy walks up to her and shoots her in the head and begins to shoot people around her um, in a shooting, in a mass shooting. She lives, um, luckily, but other people did die in that shooting in 2011. And now she's kind of become a very, very, she's very much called for, for tougher reforms now. She, she's a, 
she's a she's a victim of gun violence, and she's calling for for more gun control. Uh, she says that more laws are needed to to protect people, and her she has a group called Americans for Responsible Solutions, and they're airing a lot of TV ads this year as well in the midterm elections. And, but their ads are geared toward people like Cory Gardner who don't support gun control. They're targeting these people as saying, hey, they're not making our community safer. They're making it less safe by not supporting these reforms. And they're kind of using this reverse tactic from the NRA in what they're doing with their advertising. These groups are often, they don't have much money, though. Um, Mayors Against Illegal Guns is also a group that's trying to combat the NRA. Uh, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is the head of that. He's a billionaire, but he doesn't spend too much of his money on that. Um, it's one of his many philanthropic, um, you know, what I'm saying. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, causes out there today. And um, but he has. There are certain groups who are certainly trying to um, combat the NRA with advertising, with helping certain candidates uh, who who do support gun control. So in, uh, in Iowa right now, there's um, a TV ad running for against Congressman Dave Young. It's targeting Congressman Dave Young, who's a Republican who doesn't support gun control. If you look at the, the map, Congressman uh, uh, Young has a very strong rating from the NRA, an A rating. He, um, he's a guy who doesn't support gun control. And, and so Americans for Responsible Solutions right now is targeting Dave Young in different ads around the state of Iowa, and here's one of the ads that they're playing. Hopefully it works, but we'll have to Google it. In Iowa, men convicted of domestic abuse can buy guns without a background check. David Young opposes closing the loophole. The Washington gun lobby is spending thousands to elect Young, and Young's approach lets domestic abusers buy guns. To David Young, it's about money and politics. To women in Iowa, it's about our lives. Americans for Responsible Solutions PAC approved the content of this message. So that's an ad that's being targeted against Dave Young. And, and um, it shows a guy obviously getting out of the car with the gun, essentially you know, targeting his, his ex-wife or his, his ex-girlfriend or girlfriend, I don't know, um, in, in the house. Uh, but but this, is a, this is a serious ad that's running. And, and what they highlight is a certain piece of legislation that he didn't back, I think, in his, his time at the state capitol, state legislature there in Iowa. He's now in Washington. But, but a law that, that didn't close a loophole. So if a guy gets arrested for beating up his girlfriend or something, he, he, he's still able to possess his own gun. He can still have his gun in his house. Usually, um, some states take that, away, that right away. If you're, if you're convicted or you're arrested um, of abusing your wife, usually they they'll put a hold on you and you can't possess your guns, your guns are taken away or you have to deliver your guns. Um, because a lot of times in the US, uh, there's, there's issues around domestic violence where a guy, can, a guy grabs his gun and shoots his wife and then shoots himself. Um, that, that's something that, that, that ha happens quite a bit in, in the US. And, and there's certain laws that kind of mandate that, hey, people need to turn in their guns because this is obviously a volatile situation. We don't want anything to, to happen where someone goes off the rent, the, the edge and, and, and decides to, to, to shoot someone. Um, so that's one of the ads that Americans for Responsible Solutions is running in Iowa right now. So I, I mean, after every, every mass shooting, talk about you know, gun control happens in the US. It's just, so right now, there isn't much talk about it. I mean, there hasn't been a big mass shooting. Like I said, there was one on, on, um, on Tuesday, but, um, or on Friday, but I mean, three people died. Um, it, there's a big election coming up. It's not going to be at the top of the forefront right now. After big mass shootings in the U.S., everyone seems to kind of go to go to the podium and start talking about why there needs to be more gun control or why there shouldn't be more gun control. So it's very much one of those things that kind of has peaks and valleys in the U.S. It, it, it's talked about a lot when it happens, but when nothing's happening, people are just like, oh, whatever. No, it's, it's one of those secondary kind of issues. Um, but, but like I said, gun violence plagues American cities each and every day. Um, and there's different reasons for that. Poverty, socioeconomic reasons, um, uh, that, that, that certain gun violence occurs each day in, in America and, tar and, and hurts certain communities. Black communities suffer a lot from black on black violence. That there's, it relates to socioeconomic reasons, you know, poverty, issues like surrounding that. 
uh, and, and also issues that, that are, it's just easy to get a gun in the U.S. You can get a gun very easily in the U.S. And, it, and it's, um, it's not tough. You know someone who has a gun, you got a few bucks, they're trying to make some money, they give it to you, their hands are clean, they might have stole it from someone, um, and now you have a gun that's stolen, and it doesn't trace back to the person who gave it to you, and it, it's very easy to get a handgun in the U.S. Um, and you can carry a, a gun a lot of places in the U.S. You can't carry a big rifle around in most places, but you know, there's oftentimes in college campuses, people, students just like you guys are able to have a gun on your hip right there and sit in class. Uh, you're able to be armed. But there's certain laws in certain states where that's not allowed, but there are certain states that allow kids, students to walk around campus with guns because you know, they feel that they need to have a gun Maybe if, if more people had guns, it would prevent mass shooters, because as a mass shooter shooting, someone with a gun can shoot that person. <laughs> that, that's very much the, the mindset. Um, and that's why people like to carry guns on college campuses. Students, such certain students in the US feel the need to carry guns. And per capita, the US has the highest gun ownership of more than 170 developed countries. That's based on a number of studies out there. Um, People have guns in the U.S. I don't personally own a gun. I know a lot of people who do own guns. I know a lot of people who carry guns. I know people who have never shot guns. I've shot a gun once. I didn't care for it much, um, so I, I haven't shot it since. But I mean, I grew up in a house with guns. I mean, I was never scared of guns. Guns are just kind of normal, everyday life to see. But 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 you, I was raised around guns to respect guns and not to play with guns. But. A lot of times in the U.S., people don't have kind of that training surrounding guns, and it's kind of one of those things where it's, it's free-spirited and it's like the Wild West shoot em up kind of thing when, it, when it's really not. I mean, these are, these are killing machines. These are guns that, that take lives. But also, in the U.S., under the U.S. Constitution, you have the freedoms to carry those guns. It's your right to carry the guns. Police carry guns. You can carry a gun. Here in China, I, 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 or, or in mainland China, I, um, yesterday I was talking to students about this, and they said you can't carry, you can't get a gun if you're just an average citizen. But the police can carry a gun, right? Why is that? Why should the police be able to carry a gun and I can't carry a gun? That's, it's a good question to have. In the US, people have their, they, they feel like, hey, that's my freedom, that's my right to carry a gun. The police have a gun, why can't I have a gun? I'm just an average citizen. I'm a good citizen, I, I know what I'm doing with my gun. I'm not a bad apple. Why shouldn't I have a gun, you know? Everyone in the US who carries a gun isn't gonna shoot someone else. I mean, there are people who are very responsible with their weapons. And, and that's the views that, hey, you know, that those are some of the viewpoints, you know? I should have the right to carry guns. I should have that ability. I'm a responsible adult. Why can't I carry a gun that has a 100 round magazine? Why? Um, and, and that's kind of, those are some of the arguments that you see each and every day from Americans um, who are on different sides of the political spectrum, who are on different sides of the, the issue of guns uh, in the US. So that kind of, that's kind of what I wanted to share with you guys on, uh, on guns in the US. And I'd love to, to take some of your questions. And, and I, I'll have some questions for you all, too, about like guns. <laughs> and, 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 and should you have a gun? Why shouldn't you have a gun? Why you should have a gun? You know, why, why do some countries feel that people should be able to have guns while others don't? I, I, just, I want to hear from you guys and, and kind of get your take on things. So, yes, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start with some questions. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that is there is that really clear distinction between Republicans and Democrats? Democrats are in America that Democrats all support are uh, like anti gun control and Republicans they are anti. And is that anyone they have the different feeling from the party? And the second question is that like uh, having the freedom and then uh, some people oppose gun control. Would you like lead you to think about where freedom is really bring all the use or you? Have you ever dealt about freedom because of that? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question that, that you had about um, is, it, is, it, is it really that clear cut among parties? There's, there, when I say that usually it's politically divided, I mean, that's just kind of a lot of times it is kind of different. Uh, Democrats often support more gun reform. Republicans oppose it. But there are plenty of Democrats who don't support gun control. And there's some Republicans who say, hey, more gun control is needed. So it's not 
totally, you know, black, blue and red. Uh, those are the two party colors. It's not totally blue and red in the US. I mean, people cross over and have different viewpoints. Um, what I was just kind of saying is that's kind of like the main kind of overall consensus when you talk about gun control in the US and, and how, how the parties at least break down and, and view it. Uh, what was the second part of your question? Freedoms of, um, do I think? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And but and then that's kind of the the big argument. Um, people feel that they should have the freedom to have their guns. And and like I said, I'm a responsible adult. I should be able to have as many guns as I want and be able to carry the gun. I'm not James Holmes. I'm not. Joe Schmo on the street who has bad intentions of shooting someone. I just like to go into the grocery store with my gun on me just to feel safe, just to um, feel like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I like to carry my weapon because you never know what might happen. There might not be a police officer around to help when something bad's going on. And I have my certificate. I did, I, I had a background check, check run on me. I, I, have passed the, the concealed carry courses. I'm a responsible adult who can carry a gun. So those are people, people really, in the US you have those freedoms and those, 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 that ability to do that. And people feel like when laws start to be created to kind of minimize those or take those freedoms away, that, pe that people are very strict uh, constitutionalists. And they say, hey, if you look at our US Constitution, in the Second Amendment, we have the freedoms and the right to bear arms. And a lot, of, a lot of the argument goes back to that living, that document that was created hundreds of years ago, the US document that has the, the Second Amendment rights in there. And, and they feel like, hey, my freedoms are being infringed on when these laws are created because I'm not a bad person and I should be able to carry a gun. That's a very much an argument that you hear quite a bit in the US. Yes, no problem, thank you. And so we have questions one by one and this turn and this turn, okay? okay. So this turn first. Thank you. Uh, I also got two questions for you. Yes. Uh, first one is, uh, why do you think those anti-gun control groups are more a uh, better financed than those pro-gun control groups, as you mentioned in mm -hmm. the lecture? And the second is actually more related to journalistic practice. Uh, like, uh, as a journalist, from your own experience and uh, from your uh, observation, uh, do you feel like your uh, personal stance uh, towards this kind of gun control, this kind of controversial issue, will influence the way you write, you present the story? Yeah, that, that, those are those are both really great questions. What was the first one again? <laughs> <laughs> the first one is uh, oh, oh why, no, the anti. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think that that goes a lot back to to history. Um, the NRA is a is a group that's been around for decades in the U.S. I mean, this 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 is a group that goes back. Um, to the early 1900s. They've been around in, in a lot of communities around the country and have been this, this kind of calling group for people to come together, to go to shooting clubs, to talk about guns, to, to, to really you know, expound upon you know, gun culture in the US. And, and it's a group that people have looked to um, when they need support, when they need have questions. The NRA isn't just all about anti-gun control. They're a group that you know, helps people um, you know, do safety demonstrations for their guns, has hunter safety courses, has you know, trainings on how to clean your guns so you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Like, they, they've really been an organization that has been embedded in communities around the country, and that in turn has allowed them to have a lot of support financially. People give them money, give them money because it's, it's kind of old money in the US and, and behind the NRA that, that helps the NRA uh, because the NRA has been around so long and they've gained that power so that when gun control comes around or gun control questions come around, they have a lot of money already saved up from their, their time in the country that they can lobby lawmakers to, to not pass certain laws. They, can, they have a very powerful lobbyist group in Washington on Capitol Hill. Anytime little laws, gun control laws are are being floated around, they usually get it uh, smacked down by the NRA, who, who's very powerful and in tune with these things. I think that it, it, it relates back to, to how long it's been around. And a lot of these groups that are kind of trying to combat the NRA are very new groups within the last decade um, who are really trying to step forward. And you see 
billionaires kind of throwing money behind it, Michael Bloomberg with Mayors Against Illegal Guns. But even then, I mean, it, it hasn't had that much of an influence because these groups are so young. Um, and people are really, really in tune with the NRA in certain communities and, and really view them, um, view what the group and the organization has done over the years as, as something that, that's needed. Um, so I think that it really ties back to, to the history of the NRA and how long it's been around it in the country. The other question that you had about uh, my views, I of course have views on this. I'd be, I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you that I don't have <laughs> views. I do. I, I have strong views on gun control, but as a, as a, as a reporter, I'm very objective in my reporting. I think that it's very important just to tell both sides, to, to call, call facts into question where facts are in, the, in question, and just view it from both sides of the spectrum. I, I certainly do have views on gun laws. I'm not going to really get into them here. But, um, but, but yeah, it's, 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 it's an issue that, that everyone, I think a lot of people in the US have strong views on, because this is something that, that happens so often. Mass shootings happen so often. Daily shootings in the U.S. happen happen often um, in big cities and small towns. Uh, oftentimes, you, you'll hear about a little kid who gets into a gun cabinet or something. The New York Times had a big story earlier this year on kids getting into people not locking up their guns certain ways and kids play, rolling around with guns and and shooting themselves. These little toddlers because they they found a gun in the on the floor in their parents' bedroom. The gun's loaded, and they, they shoot themselves. And uh, I think that this is very much an issue that a lot of Americans have, have strong views on. But as a reporter, I really try and tell it you know, down the middle, because it is such a, a passionate issue. And, and you kind of hear both sides of the debate, and, and both sides have pretty strong arguments that can be pretty compelling and pretty convincing. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Curtis and Nancy. I also have two questions for you. Yeah. And the first one is, I'm wondering, is there any age restrictions for the people who can buy the guns? Mm -hmm. Like the people uh, under 21 years old in US cannot buy the alcohol or go to casino. Is there any age uh, restrictions? Yeah. And the second question is, is there any cultural perspective you can see that US people buying guns? Is there a way of showing you are pow powerful, you are ambitious, or is there a way of insecure that uh, US society is not, is not secure enough for me, so I have to uh, wear guns with me? Or yeah. is there any uh, just a violent behavior? It's a like, protest in the society, like I'm against something, so I have to uh, with my guns so that I can like, like kind of express my opinions. Yeah, yeah, that, those are two very great questions. I think that, um, you know, in the US, you can shoot a gun at a young age. There's a lot of kids who who shoot, start shooting guns at six and seven years old. They go out with their parents, they go hunting, they do hunter safety courses. Um, I know my brother was really young when he first shot a gun, uh, a rifle. Um, but he had that training to, to go and shoot a gun um, uh, with my father. And, and um, you, you can shoot a gun at young ages. It, you have to be 18 usually to buy a gun um, in the US. You have to be a certain age to, to, to buy and purchase a weapon. Um, and then even then you kind of have to go through this background check on certain things. Um, but, but yeah, there, there are certain laws in certain states on, on how old you need to, to be to, to, to possess a gun. But then once you get to certain ages, I mean, you can possess as many guns as you want to. There's no limit on, you know, you could go to Walmart tomorrow and buy four guns, buy, go, go to the next Walmart the next day and buy four more. You got eight guns right there. Do you need eight guns? I don't know. Some people like to have eight guns to have eight guns, you know? Some people like to have one, some people don't like to have any. Um, but it all goes back to that, to, to the, the freedoms and abilities in society to have guns. Why, and that goes to your second question, why do people feel the need to have guns? Do they need to feel secure? Some people live in rural parts of the country where, you know, you might not see another house for six or seven hours. You know, you're in the middle of nowhere. You're in parts of Texas, right? You know, I'm just, I'm just I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're in very rural parts. Um, and people feel like, hey, I might need a weapon to, to, to feel safety because the sheriff is, is a good 30 minutes away. So if someone breaks into my house, you know, I have my guns and I, I feel safe because I'm not going to rely on the police to come help me because they're not going to come. They're too far away. And then other people might say, you know, who live in city areas, I don't need a gun. I mean, I'm in a safe society. 
I'm in a society where there's police who have weapons, who can, who can protect us and help us. Um, but even people in cities feel like, hey, I might feel safe to have a gun. Um, and these aren't people who are sleeping with pistols under their beds or under their pillows. I mean, it might just be in a locked closet. It might just be certain places. So I think it, people's views vary quite a bit. Some people feel totally safe and have guns. They just like to have the guns because they pull them out in October and November to go hunting. And they're just in the closets there. Um, some people feel the need to come to class with a gun because they, they, they don't feel safe. They feel like there could be a shooter that comes in, one of the students might have a gun, and hey, if he has a gun, I'm going to help protect people and I'm going to feel safe and have my gun. So there's those views in the U.S. Um, toward guns and toward gun culture um, and that, that I think can vary on a case-by-case on -case basis and why people have weapons. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, what you have mentioned mostly is concern with uh, political uh, aspect, mm -hmm. like they're competing in political aspect. But I want to know something about uh, public education through by uh, these two sides. Say, if I'm a member of uh, an SA, I would do some public education, like advertisement to tell people that you should make good use of the gun. Yeah. In this way, I establish my reputation and I will gain more support from the public. Yeah. Is that true, and how much they invest in those public education? I think that the NRA, for example, does do certain things like that. I mean, they have uh, safety courses for guns to show young people who might just have their first gun or people who are first-time gun owners. They have safety manuals and safety classes and demonstrations that they do in communities around the country that, that help people know how to clean your weapon. How do you know even how to clean your gun? For safety reasons, you should keep your gun clean. Um, so they do demonstrations for that. They do shooting demonstrations. Um, so that's that's one of the, also the arguments behind the NRA. They say like we're not just a group that goes and and touts certain candidates or boosts certain candidates up uh, because they they don't support gun control or do support gun control. They also you know say hey we we're trying to prevent gun violence by showing people how to handle their weapons correctly. Um, and, and that's one of the big arguments that the NRA says that they do, which they do do. I mean, I, to give them credit, they absolutely do hunter safety demonstrations and safety demonstrations for the community. And a lot of arguments about guns in the U.S. Um, stem back to being at home. How do people view their guns at home? I, I think that if you, if you grow up around guns um, and you respect guns, and, and, and I mean, you, you have parents who who teach you how to use a gun and, and how to respect a gun, you'll probably respect the gun and, and be safe about it. But there's people who don't have that and you know who might just find a gun on the street or have someone give them a gun or have malicious views toward using a gun that, that shouldn't have weapons. And, um, and, and, and I, I mean, there's very small percentages of people who, who are crazy, who act crazy with guns in the US. I mean, th there, there are small percentages. I mean, it's not everyone is, is, is going to be a shooter or anything in the U.S. I mean, there's a lot of responsible individuals who carry weapons and who possess weapons. And, but, but to answer your question, the, the, um, uh, they, they do do a lot of safety demonstrations, and, and there are demonstrations. But I think a lot of it goes back to being at home. And, and if, you, if you're raised around guns, if people are raised around guns, how are their parents teaching them? How, what, what parenting is going on? Um, that, that's helping young people know how to use a gun or, or anything like that as, as they get older. Is there any advertisement that's Oh, advertisements on like TV and yeah. stuff? Um, you don't see that often, no. I, I mean, if you have ties with the NRA, if you look to get involved in the NRA, that's where it more comes about, but they're not really advertising these sorts of things. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where you go to them to, to look for that information and, and then it's there at your, your fingertips, essentially. But there's no real TV advertisements, or there could be billboards here and there, but I mean, I, I'm not too, too keen in with that, so. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Thank you. Hi, I'm MD. Uh, I have two questions also. Yeah, no the problem. first one is um, you, um, you just mentioned there were only a small percentage of people who are crazy about guns, but who are crazy we, with guns. With guns, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but we all know that uh, President, President Lincoln, President, um, President John Kennedy was dead because of guns. Yeah. So, and also we know that both um, President Clinton and Reno Reagan was 
facing the shooting issues in White House too. So I'm, I'm wondering, this is a high payment of um, having guns for uh, normal citizens, right? So do you think it's still necessary to keep the gun at home for um, regular citizens? My second question is for, for just my personal opinion that you, ha you can drink alcohol after 21, but you can't have a gun at 18. I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, so, yeah. Yep. No, absolutely. Um, uh, like you said, that there are presidents who have been assassinated. There's there's people that die with guns every day, and um, and and it's a, it's it's it just kind of harkens back to that issue on your viewpoint. To answer your second question a little bit about um, if you're old enough to to, to, to have a gun, you're, you're, in the U.S., when you turn 18, you can go to war. You can go to Iraq, you put your life on the line for the country. You can go to Afghanistan. Why shouldn't you be able to carry a gun? in the US? Why shouldn't you be able to smoke a cigarette or drink a beer? Um, those are some of the questions that people have. And that kind of goes back to your freedoms as an American. Um, you should be, if you can go and fight and die for your country, why can't you walk down the street with a weapon and feel safe in your country or, 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 or just feel the need to do that? Um, I think that, that a lot of that goes back to, to the Second Amendment and people viewing their constitutional uh, rights, as, rights as Americans. Um, and yeah, I mean, to answer, to, to look at your first question, that there there has been a lot of historic moments in the U.S. where where guns have have been used. I mean, like you said, the uh, Kennedy, Lincoln were assassinated, um, but but it's just one of those it, it's one of those things where where those were big, high profile presidents. But I mean, there's there's kids every day killed on the streets by guns, and then there's people who you know use guns responsibly, and and it's very much. Um, an issue of I don't think there will that guns are so embedded in U.S. culture that they're never it's never going to be a case where there won't be guns. I mean, it's just how do you regulate those guns and how do you create reforms that that try to to, to really regulate them? And and in the U.S. that hasn't been found yet. I mean, there there hasn't been a, a lot of um, gun control passed at the federal level. So I think that that answers a key question that people might you know it, for all the rhetoric and all the discourse about it. People don't feel like you know there needs to be that much reforms because if you look in Washington, there hasn't been many tough reforms. So it's kind of one of those questions that yeah we're for it, we're against it, but it seems like more people are kind of against the tougher reforms and kind of turning their head until the next shooting happens. And it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, eh, we'll deal with it the next time maybe, or we'll talk about it again. But it's not one of those high-profile issues. Um, uh, each and every day. It's one of those high profile issues after a shooting usually occurs. Thanks. Just a note, Connie, uh, just on the constitutional yeah. discussion, I mean, the Second Amendment, amendment I think, is bear arms, the right to bear arms and raise a militia. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the, the situation now is an, is, is an abuse of that? Do you think it does, it, does the Second Amendment legitimize the current situation in America, or do you think the people that use that as an argument are actually, that was not the intention when that was drawn up at yeah. the start? I think that, that, that it goes back to, to looking at the Constitution as this living and breathing document. Um, a lot of people look at the, the Constitution hundreds of years ago. I mean, it was created, and, and at that time, it gave people the right to bear arms. And it, we live in a different society now. When that document was created, you had little muskets and guns that, that you know, shoot one little bullet and it's over, you know, and everyone could have one of those. But now we live in this day and age where there's high-powered assault-style military rifles that are created. Should everyone be able to have those? Um, and it's, I think it's all about how you interpret that Constitution. Is the Constitution this living and breathing document that evolves over time? Or should it be interpreted the way it was in the 1700s when it was created? What, how do you view it? I'm making sure I know my American history because we're on camera. Um, but, um, but yeah, how do you view that document um, to this day? And I think that there's certain viewpoints that a lot of people who are against stricter gun control view the document as it was back then when it was created, that freedom, that Second Amendment right to bear arms. And it is certainly, I think it is to a certain extent, that, that argument might be abused quite a bit. And people are really exploiting that constitutional right but um, and that's why you know a lot of people view, view the Constitution as this document that should evolve with time to the current society that we live in and should be altered and and um, and, and there should be certain things that are tweaked to it to, to address how we live in society right now. So I think it's very much a constitutional question and, and how you you view the Constitution in the U.S. because some people do view it as this living, breathing document that should evolve 
Others are very strict constitutionalists who view it as it should be, uh, it should be addressed the way it was when it was created hundreds of years ago. I would like to draw the attention uh, between uh, the possession of guns of citizens and uh, the policy of the U.S. police. Do you think that the reason why uh, U.S. citizens can possess guns is that um, the U.S. police fail to maintain peace and social justice? I think that um, I think that the, the argument might. I don't, I don't think that police fail to 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 create a safe environment in the U.S. I think that, that um, there are plenty of safe communities in the U.S. The U.S. is a, is, I view the U.S. as a safe society, um, despite, you know, guns being allowed for people to possess. I, I find it very safe. Um, and I think that it goes back to more of a question of, 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 of your rights, of why should the police be able to have a gun and you can't have a gun? Well, do the police have some special training? Who are, or do they have some special training that I can't have, that I can't, that, 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 that doesn't allow me to, put, to, to have a weapon? So I, I, I think that the question, um, and, and it's a good question, I, I, think, I don't think that the reason people have guns is because there's not law and order in the streets by the police. I think there's plenty of law and order. I think that um, it just kind of goes back to that question of, of your rights as a, as a person and, and your rights to, 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 to have a weapon and, and, and your ability as an American to, to possess a weapon. I don't think that it goes back to really questions of, of safety or not feeling safe because police. I think there's questions of um, sometimes the police aren't always around to help you and you kind of have to have law and order in your own hands and, and, and seek out your own protections. That's why uh, you might possess a gun or have a gun. Um, maybe you just have a gun because, like I said, you like to go hunting at certain times, and that's your freedom to have that gun and take it out when you want to. It's also your freedom to walk into class if you have a concealed carry permit with a gun on your hip and sit down and, and listen to a lecture. Um, I think that it just kind of varies from, from, from instance to instance, but I, I don't think it's a reason um, that people uh, feel that, the, that they're not safe, that police aren't necessarily doing their job. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, I have a simple question, but uh, not related to guns. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> just that uh, you used to work for the uh, Denver Post, and uh, you're now in the Los Angeles um, Times. Yeah. Uh, so what's the difference between working in a more local newspaper and a national newspaper in the oh. United States? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I, um, Thank you. I, um, and that's, a, that's funny you bring that up because uh, I, I worked at the Denver Post for three years and um, that's a great newspaper and it's, a, it's a, my home state newspaper and you know, seeing my name in that paper every day was, was great but this was an <laughs> opportunity to go to a, a different newspaper and I was actually talking to David Borman about this in a cab two nights ago. I said, you know, do you think the LA Times is a national newspaper? And he said, no, it's not a national <laughs> newspaper, only people in California read it. I was like, really? We have bureaus around the world. We have bureaus around the country. This is a national newspaper. And for my ego, I like to think it's a national newspaper. You know? like, I'm for a local newspaper. I'm for a national newspaper. I moved up in the chain a little. Um, but but it, it's good. I mean, it's, it's a good opportunity. Um, when you work for a bigger news organization, there's more money behind it. There's more you know, opportunities to, to you know, travel abroad. Like I said, there's bureaus. There's two reporters in Beijing for the LA Times. There's people all around the world in Mexico and in Europe and, and there's just different opportunities for that. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that I don't miss the Denver Post, which does great journalism and, and those folks are like family to me. They're, they're great individuals. So, but um, but yeah, this is a, a new opportunity and a good opportunity and I do like to think this is a national news or <laughs> news What do you guys think it is? I think it is, you know. We'll just we'll just say it is. It's just kind of <laughs> but um, but that, I hope that answers your question. Okay, I'll bring Does the it? Question. Okay, good. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I'll bring the question back to guns. Okay. Uh, you said that... We can, we can talk about uh, You said that uh, in, American people can, <laughs> in American people can actually walk around with a gun in their pocket because they feel that they are responsible adults. But uh, maybe having a gun may make people feel powerful and make them violent release the crack in their, in their heart. And I actually heard that several years ago an NBA player Gilbert Arenas, and he and his teammate put, gun, uh, uh, put 
uh, pistols at each other in the locker room. Yeah. So, what do you think of that? So, if there's something can be done to uh, as precaution. Yeah, I mean that's just silly. If you're pointing guns at people, I mean I don't think that that's that's responsible. I, I think that if people are responsible gun owners, then that's good. I mean, but if you're just, um, you know, like you said, some people do carry guns around because it makes them feel good or you know makes them feel kind of this sense of power. Um, but but others others certainly carry guns around because they feel like it's safety. There's plenty of people who might have, a, have in the U.S. have um, lawmakers, the state legislature, are able to carry guns on themselves, and, and they do. And you ne you'd never know it. You're just having a conversation with someone, and they have two guns on them, but you would never see them. I mean, and, and they would never want you to see them because they just want to be responsible with them, just in case something were to happen. They would pull them out. You know, right then that they had a gun, but they're not. They're there to essentially help you and for safety. Um, and I think it's all about being responsible with guns too. So one example, a lawmaker uh, this year, actually earlier this year, had a gun, had a, a committee hearing room at the state legislature. They people came to testify on a bill, and he had a gun in his bag. And the committee hearing ended, and everyone left, and he left his bag in the room. And because he just forgot it, he's running out, and he left his bag in the room. And one of the, the clerks who was there to clean up the room went by and opened the bag. Well, whose bag is this? And opened it up and saw the gun. And it's just a loaded gun sitting there in the room. And he wasn't responsible with his weapon. He totally forgot it. He left the room without it. And that gun, uh, he was barred from bringing that gun into the Capitol. He, he, he barred himself from doing that. He said, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, I wasn't responsible with it. I'm not going to take this gun into the Capitol anymore. So I think that it's very much, you know, one of those things where, where um, some people do very much feel like, you know, tough with the gun. Others just feel like they're 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 being safe with it, and and, and it's needed because, um, you know, they have a gun. Police have guns. Um, you know, they should be able to have a gun as well. So. And I think that in, in U.S. society, I think that police officers even, <coughs> there's questions from police officers saying, you know, should all these people have guns? I, I mean, they don't necessarily sometimes feel safest uh, with, with individuals who have weapons as well. So. Uh, thank you. I will put the uh, put the question session off the gun again. Uh, so uh, I have three questions. The first one is: uh, there are a lot of breaking news around the world, and how how do you do to guarantee uh, the accuracy of about those uh, breaking news in such a very a very short time? And the second question is. Uh, if you are not at the scene when this uh, kind of uh, incident happens, uh, how how do you collect those informations? If uh, you want to collect, like uh, there are a lot of citizen journalists uh, these days, if you want to collect those information on Twitter or something, uh -huh. how do you guarantee those credibility? And the third question is, uh, I think the internet has break uh, has broken the wall of the uh, kind of media's role in in the past, like the gatekeeper. And uh, how do you think those uh, uh, the Chinese central government su uh, create such a uh, kind of this wall to uh, censor, censor, uh, censor, uh, put censorship on those media? Thank you. Yeah, I think that <coughs> with the censorships. Um, some of the censorships in China, it, it does make journalists' jobs a little difficult, a much more difficult in, uh, in producing news and, and, and vetting news also in social media. Uh, for example, reporting stories that I'm not, where I'm not at on the actual scene, you do rely a lot on social media to get facts and, and sometimes and, and you call people and, and try and get answers. So I think that you know, how you separate the, the BS from the real stuff, I mean, you, you go to, to, to sources usually, and a lot of a lot of U.S. police departments right now have Twitter accounts, have certain accounts that, that they tweet news and tweet information from. Um, so those are good sources to look for. Um, those are author authorities um, that you trust with facts. They're not going to tweet out anything bad. Usually you can report that off of that information. And you really just try and weed things out. I mean, you're looking for credible individuals who are following these stories. You're looking at, if I'm in Los Angeles and a big breaking story might be going on in 
in, um, in Kansas City or something, I'm looking at local Kansas City journalists, their Twitter accounts to get news, um, uh, to, to kind of vet the news, to really try and get the facts out there. I think that um, as journalists, uh, social media is something that, that's key to, to your everyday lives and, and in breaking news. It's how I consume my news. It's how I break news as well. Um, I'm going to usually tweet it out there before I write the story because you want to get out there first with that information and then come back with the story that people can read. Um, but I, I think that censorship, obviously, that's something that, that, that can hinder how you do your job. If, if, if you can't access certain websites or access certain materials, um, if you're only accessing certain things that perhaps the government wants you to see, it's not giving that full full picture. You're not answering all of the questions that, that people might have. In my reporting, I like to just try and be as thorough as possible to the point of when you sit down and read my story, you're not going to have much, many questions um, after you read it. You might not agree with some of the points that are made in there, but I'm going to tell both sides. I'm going to be as thorough as possible, but I'm going to give this view, this, this wide perspective of, of the story. Um, you had three questions. I hope I answered two. Did I? All right. Look, look, look. Um, what was the third one? Sorry. I think it's the first one I uh, mentioned about the breaking news. How do you do to guarantee uh, the accuracy during the uh, such a uh, short time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you want to be fast, but you want to be accurate. I mean, that's what, you, yeah, sometimes you're not going to be first on a story. I think that's what Ann Kornblut said the other day. Um, sometimes it's good to be second on a story because you want to have the facts. You want to make sure you're going out there with the correct information because it's much easier to be second. It's much tougher to have a correction. And as a journalist, you don't want to have corrections. You want to get out there with the news first, um, when at all possible. But first and foremost, you want to be out there with the news uh, accurate and being accurate. Um, regarding the time, I think we can have the last question. And more questions can be asked after the lecture. Hi, I want to ask a question related to guns. I want yeah. to know, um, did, did any people or the party man, party member uh, propose that uh, any substitutions or alternative instead of guns for citizens to buy? Is there an alternative to guns? Yeah. Um, yeah, a rock, a knife, <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, nunchucks or something, I don't know. Like, I mean, I have checked the, net web, uh, the website and they propose that uh, some light machine guns, or I don't, uh, maybe they are less damaging or dangerous that uh, citizens can buy instead of guns. Uh, like a weapon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, th there's plenty of, of weapons out there that, that people can buy. Um, but, but obviously, I, I think that in the U.S., I mean, there, people are ingrained a lot in, in gun culture and, and collecting guns and using guns. Um, uh, it, for example, if you're worried about safety, why would you buy a knife when other people can buy a gun? You know, the, the gun's going to usually win in that fight. So um, if, it, if there's those kind of issues, you're, you're usually going to look to buy a gun. But there's plenty of weapons out there that people look to use as alternatives. Um, some people don't like to carry any weapons. They might use pepper spray or, or something like that. Or uh, tasers are also big, too, that, that you shoot it out and shock people. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think that, that guns are, are, are just so much of a part of society in the US that, that oftentimes, why would you use any other weapon when you, can, when you can have a gun? I hope that answered it, yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, since we have run out of time, uh, let's thank again for Curtis for this great topic. Thank you. And if you have more questions, you can um, communicate with Curtis after this lecture. And thank you again for your attendance. Uh, if the chair is not uh, original here, please uh, return to where they should be. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.